Parshas Re'eh has 126 verses and a staggering 55 mitzvos, and it marks a transition in the book. Unlike the beginning of Deuteronomy, this parsha and the three that precede it, roughly, are not about the admonishment, not about the rebuke of the nation, not about necessarily the warnings. It's about the mitzvos, and there's a repetition of mitzvos that we've seen in the past. There's some new ones that we hitherto have not seen, and it's, of course, important to remember that the Ramban tells us in the beginning of the book that even though these mitzvahs appear first in the Torah in Deuteronomy, in actuality they were conveyed to Moshe at Sinai, but they were only conveyed to the nation when they became pertinent, either because they're about to enter the land and these are mitzvahs that relate to the land, alternatively because they're mitzvahs that are very rare and therefore he didn't want to inundate them in the desert, in the wilderness, and only when he's departing from them did he inform them of the mitzvos that are more rare and don't appear so often. And the parsha begins, See, I present before you today a blessing and a curse, the blessing that you hearken the commandments of Hashem your God that I command you today, and the curse if you do not hearken to the commandments of Hashem your God and you stray from the path that I command you today, you follow the gods of others, gods that you did not know. Now, the parsha begins with his presentation of blessings and curses, and they're going to be on Mount Rizim and Mount Abel. These are mountains that are near Shechem, near what's today the modern city of Nablus in, in the West Bank, quote unquote, in Judea and Samaria. And the actual nature of these blessings and curses, the content and how it actually was done is actually a subject we're going to read about it later on in chapter 27 of the book of Deuteronomy. But it's just brought down briefly over here and the details are going to be given to us later on in chapter 27. Now, Rashi here tells us when it lists the fa- the curse, the, when you depart from the path that God commands us today, we follow all other gods. Rashi tells us that if someone does idolatry, that is equivalent to them deviating, departing straight from the path that the Jewish people were commanded. Meaning that if someone does idolatry, it's equivalent to them repudiating All of Torah, and the converse is true as well, if someone repudiates idolatry in all its ways, in every component of idolatry, if you completely repudiate idolatry, then it is the same as you completely embracing Torah. This is one of the meta themes of mitzvos, that really all mitzvos, positive mitzvos, are oriented around deepening our connection that we have with the Almighty. In effect, the first of the Ten Commandments is all the positive mitzvos, to believe in God. And all the negative mitzvahs, the things that we're supposed to avoid, are all subcategories. They all contain within it elements of idolatry. And thus, really, our relationship with God is is almost binaries. Are we embracing God and his mitzvahs and going further away from idolatry? Or, God forbid, are we doing the opposite and embracing idolatry? And that's the blessing and the curse that Moses presents to the people. Now, Rashi tells us that... This is going to be done on Mount Gerizim. This is a process that was eventually done by Joshua, but it's going to be commanded to to Joshua that when he crosses over the Jordan, there has to be this very momentous experience on these two mountains. Half the nation is going to send to one mountain, Mount Gerizim. The other half is going to go to the other mountain, Mount Abel, and then the Levites are in the middle with the ark, and they're going to give 11 blessings and curses as they face this mountain and that mountain, and everyone announces amen, everyone signs off on these blessings, and that's going to hopefully assure that the beginning of the commonwealth, the beginning of the dwelling of the land, is it's not on the right foot. And there's an interesting balaturim here, because if you read the verse, verse 30, it says the location of these two mountains, there on the other side of the Jordan, in the direction of the sunset, in the land of the Canaanite, dwells in the plain far from Gilgal, near the plains of Morah. So it's giving us the coordinates of this location. The Balaturim tells us that this verse, if you take the, the deeper meaning of the verse, you'll find a hint to Aaron's name. Why? Because now, because Aaron has passed, you no longer have the clouds of glory that would provide – it would be your compass. It would be your, your your GPS. It would be your navigator. It would tell you where you need to go. So in fact, this verse that gives us the coordinates, the location of these mountains is actually reflective 
of the demotion of the nation, they no longer have the clouds of glory that was given to them in, in the merit of Aaron. They no longer have that. And therefore, it's important for them to be given direction to where the location of this event is supposed to be. Now, the Ramban, he notes, of course, like we mentioned, that the details of this blessing and curse, is, is, uh, those, those details are found in chapter 27. So why does it mention here, as it's about to launch into a bevy of mitzvos, it begins with this introduction, this stark introduction of the blessing and the curse. It's because really the, the option of, of mitzvos to embrace it or to not embrace it is equivalent to the blessing and curses, the life and death, the Mount Gerizim and Mount Abel. And therefore, before Moses begins to delineate the mitzvos, he tells them really what's at stake, that this is a question of life and death. It's a question of blessing and curse. And it's the same thing, really, that the Jewish nation is going to do as a whole on Mount Gerizim and Mount Abel. So with that introduction, the mitzvos begin in rapid succession. Chapter 12, these are the decrees and the ordinances that you shall observe to perform in the land that Hashem, the God of your forefathers, has given you to possess it all the days that you live on the land. And of course, whenever it talks about mitzvos, it begins right away with idolatry. And there are numerous times in the book where the Jewish nation is, is warned very starkly to not descend the ways of idolatry. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations you shall possess, they worship their gods, the mountains, the hills, the leafy trees. When you find their altars, you should shatter them. When you find their pillars, you should smash them. When you find their sacred trees that they used to worship, burn in fire. You take the carved images they have, you cut them down. You should totally obliterate their names from that place. Rashi tells us, it's not just enough to destroy it, you have to uproot it, you have to shatter it, you have to mock it, you have to deride it. And in fact, it says uh, you should obliterate their names. That's a reference to the fact that we're supposed to actually create nicknames for the idols. Rashi tells us that if it has one name, you you alter it a little bit in a way that is uh, mocking fashion. The Talmud tells us that all forms of mockery are prohibited with the exception of mockery of idolatry, which is encouraged. And that's because idolatry, at least at a time where idolatry was practiced and the desire for idolatry was present, it was something that was so captivating. It had such a draw. It clenched its adherence with such a vise that the really only way to get rid of it, to break the addiction, was to shatter it, was to destroy it, was to mock it, was to deride it. That is the the way, the prescription of how someone can unshackle themselves from the addiction of, of idolatry. In fact, I would imagine that all addictions really follow this same kind of pattern. The Talmud tells us in the book of Sanhedrin, it gives us a list of people who become disqualified from offering testimony because they're, they're sinners or because they're people who are not involved with society. And it gives a list of people who are gamblers, people who loan money with interest against Torah law, pigeon racers. These are people that, that, that have habits that are destructive or are immoral or are ones that remove them from, from normal, healthy society. And therefore, these people cannot be trusted to have their testimony accepted in a Jewish court of law. And the Talmud tells us that how does someone who has the status of a gambler, has the status of someone who loans with interest, has the status of someone who does business with the fruits of Shemitah, has the status of someone who races pigeons, how do they remove that status? And how do they enable themselves to once again provide testimony? And the Talmud tells us that they have to actually take the paraphernalia that they used for the previous habit and they have to destroy it. If they use cards or if they use various other paraphernalia for whatever they did, they have to actually flush it out of the toilet. They have to get rid of it. And as an aside, you know, if someone, God forbid, is, is an addict and they are dependent on narcotics or maybe even on cigarettes, it's not just enough for them to decide to, to develop the wherewithal, the fortitude to make a decision that I'm going to say goodbye to the thing that I'm dependent on. That's that's not enough. You have to destroy. You have to shatter it. 
in a way that's outlined over here, the Jewish people. They have some history with idolatry. They spent a long time in Egypt. At the splitting of the sea, they were spiritually equivalent to the idolaters that were being drowned. And therefore, it's important. You're about to go into the hotbed of idolatry. Make sure that you're armed with the tools to not be swallowed away into that world. You shall not do this to Hashem your God, rather only the place Hashem your God will choose from among all the tribes to place his name there shall you seek out his presence and come there. So verse 4, it's not actually a clear transition how it goes from destroying their idols to not doing this to Hashem your God. So Rashi gives us three different opinions as to what it is that we should not do. The first opinion is that the idolaters, they have altars and they have temples and they have pillars and they have sacred trees in all kinds of places. But no, you shouldn't do that. Rather, there's one place. The Almighty is going to select one place to have the tabernacle and subsequently the temple there. And you should coalesce all to that same location. You shouldn't have your spiritual venues scattered throughout the land. That's the first Opinion of Rashi as to what it means in verse 4. Alternatively, it means that we should not destroy God's name. We should not remove a stone from the altar. Or finally, we should not emulate the ways of the Canaanites, the ways of the Gentiles, and that will cause that our sins, i.e. of emulation of the Canaanites, that will cause that the tabernacle will be destroyed, the temple will be destroyed, and we will be banished from the land. Do not act in a way that will cause us to be booted from the land. Now, one of the motifs that we see in the Parsha and really throughout the whole Torah is that it hints about the temple, the permanent location for the tabernacle, but it calls it the place. It's one of these motifs that Jerusalem, we know, is the location of the permanent dwelling place of God. The temple, it's not mentioned by name and it's obscure. Whenever God chooses the place, that's the place. And we know that this is the place that was designated since the times of Abraham. The binding of Isaac happened on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. And that is the place that is designated for the permanent domicile of God. So why is it not mentioned explicitly? So the Rabbeinu B'chai here quotes the Rambam. The Rambam gives us three very interesting reasons as to why Jerusalem is not mentioned explicitly. Number one, he says that if the non-Jews, if they knew that this place is most auspicious for acceptance of prayer and of sacrifices, all the nations would fight to be able to have control over it. And there'll be lots of destruction, lots of death as a result of the fighting, the infighting amongst the nations over control of this very important piece of real estate. In fact, we know throughout history, the location, the real estate, the parcel of land that is most disputed is Temple Mount in Jerusalem in Mount Moriah. And who knows how much worse it would have been if the information as to this being the most holy place, the most auspicious place, if that was known to everyone, who knows how much bloodshed would have resulted. A second reason, says the Rambam, that the Canaanites, had the Canaanites knew where the location of the Jewish people, where the final resting place, so to speak, of the tabernacle of God is going to be, they would sabotage it. And therefore, in order to keep it in a need-to-know basis, it wasn't put down in the Torah. And finally, if the tribes who are about to enter the land and have the land divided up, if the tribes knew that one of those parcels of land, one of the ancestral homelands of the tribes is going to be the same location that the that the temple, the tabernacle is going to be placed, everyone will be jockeying, everyone will be fighting for it, and therefore as a way to prevent discord amongst the nation, its location was obscured. Okay, so we talk, we start talking about the location of the temple, the tabernacle, and that's the location where we have to bring our sacrifices to. And we go there and you bring your cattle and your flock and you offer sacrifices, all kinds of sacrifices. There you should eat, there you should rejoice. This is the place of celebration. This is the place where we go to offer sacrifices. However, we cannot have private altars. We can't have everyone have in their backyard a personal little altar. No, because once we cross over the Jordan, even though for 14 years of conquest, we can have a 
private altar, but once things settle down, we can only go to the tabernacle and subsequently the temple. But even in an altar, Rashi tells us that there are certain sacrifices that can be brought in an altar, like the personal sacrifices, but others are not allowed to be brought in the altar. And then we read, you shall cross the Jordan and settle in the land that Hashem your God causes you to inherit, and he will give you rest from all your enemies, and you will dwell securely. And what happens then? It shall be that the place where Hashem your God will choose to rest his name, there shall you bring everything to command you, the elevation offerings, feast offerings, your tithes, all the sacrifices you should do in the temple once you have quieted your enemies. And indeed, we know that once David finally achieved hegemony and sovereignty over the entire land, all the enemies were finally silenced. Then he moved on to fulfill this mitzvah to build a permanent temple for God. As an aside, this mitzvah is still present to us. And maybe we could say that the second there is a satisfactory resolution and the enemies have been relocated or have been quieted, we would we too would have this mitzvah even today to build the temple on Temple Mount. And then it goes to talk about what happens when you have sacrifices that lost their sanctity under certain circumstances. They could be eaten like the deer and the heart, just like you have the kosher animals, the deer, the heart, that are never brought as sacrifices, those erstwhile sacrifices that lost their sanctity can be eaten like the deer in the heart. They don't need, you don't need to be holy. You don't need to be pure. You don't need to be in certain locations. You can eat it whenever you want. However, its blood need not be covered. So this is we saw a little bit earlier in Leviticus that birds and undomesticated animals, it's a mitzvah after you sacrifice or you slaughter them, it's a mitzvah to cover their blood, almost like in a burial ritual. And that applies only to birds and undomesticated animals like the deer and the heart. Whereas domesticated animals like cattle and uh, cows and the like, bovines, there is no mitzvah for you to cover their blood. And here we see that a sacrifice that's from a domesticated animal, its blood does not need to be covered Unlike the deer in the heart whose blood needs to be covered, it does not need to be covered. And then it begins to list the various foods that must be eaten in Jerusalem. So there's the second tithing. And this is the concept of tithing, which is 10% of your produce or of your income that you give to charity. But that is given to the Levite. The Levite is the clergyman. So that's 10% that goes to the Levite. It's called the first tithing. And then there's the second tithing, which is 10 to 20% which is called the second tithing. And that is consumed by the owner, but it's consumed in Jerusalem. So if you, let's say, have 100 bushels, 10 bushels, the first tithing goes to the Levite, goes to the clergyman, 10 bushels you bring with you to Jerusalem and you eat them in Jerusalem over the uh, pilgrimage times. You go to Jerusalem typically for one of the three festivals, for Pesach, Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot, you'll bring your second tithing and you eat it together with your family while celebrating in Jerusalem. So that has been eaten in Jerusalem. First born animals that are given to the Kohen are eaten by the Kohen in Jerusalem. Various other offerings and Bikurim, the first fruit, which is a mitzvah that we'll see in a couple of weeks, that too must be eaten in Jerusalem. And again, we see a warning, one that we've seen in the past and we'll see again in this week's parsha. Beware for yourself lest you forsake the Levite all your days on your land. And the Levite, he plays a very important role in Jewish life. He's the clergyman, and therefore, because he provides the nation with spiritual sustenance, in exchange, his physical sustenance is provided to him by the nation. That's the exchange. And therefore, it's very important for us when we celebrate, when we enjoy the physical bounty, the material bounty that God gives us, to not forget the Levite, and the, the standards of the Levite, the Ram tells us, is those who study Torah, don't forget them. It's our mandate to provide them physical sustenance in exchange for them providing us spiritual sustenance. And then we read a very interesting series of verses in chapter 12, verse 20. When Hashem your God will broaden your boundaries, as he spoke to you, and you shall say, I would like to eat meat, for you have a desire to eat meat. To your heart's desire, may you eat meat. 
So this is a verse about someone who just wants to have dinner. It's not a sacrificial meat. It's not bringing a sacrifice, no elevation sacrifice, peace offering sacrifice. No, there's no vow here. They just want to eat meat because they enjoy burgers. But they happen to be very distant from Jerusalem or from the place where God selects, so the tabernacle. They're distant from the location of sacrifices. So what do you do? If the place, this is verse 21, if the place where Hashem your God will choose to place his name will be far from you, you may slaughter from your cattle, from your flocks that Hashem has given you as I have commanded you, and you may eat in your cities according to your heart's desire. So this is an amazing layout of the idea of eating non-sacrificial meat. We would call this dinner. And we see that if the place is distant from us, i.e. if the tabernacle is distant, we live a thousand miles from the tabernacle, then it's okay for us to eat non-sacrificial meat. And there's two amazing insights here that Rashi tells us. What this means is, number one, that the holiness in the Jewish world, that's the default. You think about the context over here. It tells us to build the base of Middash, to build the permanent temple, to not use private altars. And of course, in the temple, you bring sacrifices. And many sacrifices, a portion of that meat goes to the Kohen, a portion of it is burnt on the altar, and a portion of it goes to the owner, the person who brought the sacrifice. And therefore, under normal circumstances, when someone wants to eat meat, it is done in that setting, it is done in a holy setting, in a sacrificial setting. What about regular meat? What about just you want to eat the burger? Here we see how the Torah presents that. You live very far. God expanded your borders. It's so far to go to Jerusalem. Oh, okay. You could still eat the meat to your heart's desire. Slaughter it as I instructed you, as I commanded you, and you could eat it to your heart's content. What that's telling us is that a standard meat meal by the Torah's perspective, is a mitzvah. However, under extenuating circumstances, to eat regular unholy meat meal, okay, it's also fine, because after all, it's very inconvenient for you to travel with Jerusalem, and therefore it's okay for you to not travel, it's so far. This, I think, is a maybe an attitudinal shift for us, that we maybe think that our relationship with God, our relationship with Torah, with mitzvahs, it's a nice thing to do from time to time. It's a nice thing to add on to our regular life. And here we see the Torah's perspective is that it's the standard. And in fact, the unholy, the regular meal, that's something that's out of the ordinary. That's something that happens, oh, because we live so far, it's too inconvenient. Oh, okay, in those circumstances, you can have a regular, ordinary meal. That's one amazing idea that we see here as explicated by Rashi. Now, in addition, if you read this verse very carefully, it tells us that we have to slaughter the animal first. But how do we have to slaughter it? You may slaughter from your cattle and from your flocks that Hashem has given you as I have commanded you. Rashi tells us, we hear, we read from this verse that there is a way, a proper way to slaughter an animal. And those are the laws of shechita, the laws of ritual slaughtering, which is done to make any animal kosher, if to slaughter it in the proper way. And there's voluminous literature that's actually how to do it. Says Rashi, these were laws that were conveyed to Moses at Sinai, i.e. Moses never committed those laws to the written Torah. Those was, that was conveyed orally by Moses to the Jewish people. And here we see in the verse 21 of chapter 12 of Deuteronomy, we see evidence, we see incontrovertible evidence from the written Torah to the existence of the oral Torah. Because the written Torah references the oral Torah. It says, you slaughter the animal as I commanded you. And if you look, if you search from the first letter of Genesis to the final letter of Deuteronomy, the whole Torah, you find nary a reference onto how to slaughter an animal to make it kosher. Yet Moses says, as I commanded you. Clearly, Moses himself is telling us that he commanded us, but he did not write it down in the Torah. So if someone believes in the divinity of the written Torah, like we, of course, do, 
we have evidence from the written Torah to some other companion corpus, what we call the oral Torah, the parts of Moses' commandments and Moses' instruction, Moses' guidance, and the Torah that Moses got from God that he gave to us that was not written, at least not initially by Moses, and that is, of course, what we call the oral Torah. Very powerful set of verses here. So we're allowed to eat meat, even if it's not holy. We can eat it like the deer and like the heart. Again, those two animals which are never brought as sacrifices are referenced. However, verse 23, only be strong not to eat the blood. For the blood, it's the life. And therefore, you can't eat the life of the animal with the animal with the meat. Don't eat it. Pour it on the ground. Don't eat it. And get another warning. It will be well for you and your children after you. You do what's right in the eyes of God. You obey the mitzvah of God not to eat the blood. Don't eat the blood. So Rashi asked the question, why does this mitzvah of all the mitzvahs need to be encouraged? We need to have this strengthening. Only be strong. Don't eat the blood. Why do we need to be given all these warnings against eating blood? Just say don't eat blood. Why do we need to be strengthened? So Rashi gives us two almost contradictory answers. First, he says, we have to be encouraged. We have to be strengthened not to eat the blood. Because the Jewish people, they were immersed in blood consumption. They loved it. They would eat it all the time. And therefore, that to be extra encouraged to not eat the blood. That's the first opinion that Rashi brings. And the second opinion is almost the exact opposite. And that is to inform us how much care we have to be to, uh, to obey the mitzvahs. Because after all, who even wants to eat blood? It's disgusting. You don't desire it at all. And if something that we don't desire, and still a Torah has to go out of its way to strengthen and encourage and make sure and repeatedly warn us about, how much more so must we be careful to obey all the rest of the mitzvahs? That's what the two opinions that Rashi brings on uh, verse 23. There's a very lengthy and interesting explanation in the Ramban to explain why the nation was obsessed with eating blood. And he says, this is a theme that he's spoken about in the past. We might we might have mentioned it as well in the past. He says that when they were in Egypt, they had an unusual tendency of offering sacrifices to demons. And part of the process of doing that was eating blood and doing all kinds of spooky ceremonies with blood to try to connect to these demons and to try to glean insights into the future from these demons. And he ends off by telling us that if you find someone who eats blood and is somehow able to predict the future or able to do some sort of miracle, don't be convinced. This is a, just a demon whisperer. You know that he's he's full of it. He He's descending into uh, the creepy territory and – Later on in the partial, we'll read about the false prophet. This guy will fall into the category of the false prophet. Don't fall for his shtick. So a really interesting idea that Ramban says that the eating of the blood was a practice that was done in Egypt, even by some Jews, as a way to worship the demons and to try to gain insights from them. And he doesn't suggest that this is the reason why the Torah prohibited it, but he, it's, it is an interesting background as to uh, maybe why the Torah strengthened uh, so much that we we should not behave in this uh, in this contemptible way. Now in verse 25, Rashi asked the question, why is the prohibition against consuming blood? Why is it repeated three times? And he tells us a very powerful idea, similar to what he said earlier, we should go and take a lesson from this, how much reward there is in mitzvos. You see a mitzvah like not consuming blood. A person is disgusted by it. You have no desire for it. Yet we see in verse 23, don't eat it in order that be well with you and your children. The Torah promises if we refrain, if we withhold from consuming blood, it's not only going to be good for us, it's going to be good for our children afterwards. What an amazing promise from God here. And that's for a mitzvah that we don't even desire. How much more reward for things like theft and prohibited promiscuity that we do have a desire for, how much more reward will we gain by withholding, by refraining from doing things that we are desirous of? 
Then it talks about offering sacrifices in Jerusalem. We could eat non-sacrificial food outside Jerusalem, but sacrificial food has to be eaten in Jerusalem, brought to the temple. Then we read a very beautiful promise in verse 28, safeguard and hearken to all these words that I command you in order to be well with you and your children after you forever when you do what is good and right in the eyes of Hashem, your God. And then we read verse 29, when Hashem, your God, will cut down the nations to which you come to take possession from them before you. And you'll take possession from them and settle in their land. Don't be attracted to what they have done, to the idols that you destroyed. Don't say, oh, how exactly did they worship their gods? Maybe I'll do the same. No, don't do that. Rather, instead, you should not do so to Hashem, your God, for everything that is an abomination of Hashem that he hates. That's what they did, even their sons and their daughters, they burned in the fire for their gods. Rashi says it wasn't just their sons and daughters. It was also their parents. It brings us really heinous, macabre story. Rabbi Akiva said, I saw a non-Jew. I saw a heathen who took his father. And in some sort of pagan ritual, he had his dog eat his father. Really heinous things that were were present. So Rashi and the Ramban have, have different ways of reading these verses from verse 29 till the end of the chapter. So 29, 30, and 31. Rashi reads it quite simply. Don't emulate them. After all, God destroyed them for a reason. And don't worship their gods even in unusual ways. Of course, there are ways that are the universal ways of worshiping idols, and that's sacrificing to the idols, doing incense offerings to their idols, pouring libations for the idols, bowing down to them. Those are the standard practices that are prohibited for any any pagan, any, any idol. And even the things that are specific to a certain variety of idol gives an example. They used to defecate in front of one idol. They would throw rocks at a second idol because that's the way that these idols are worshipped. They too are prohibited. That's how Rashi reads it. He says, simply don't emulate them in any way. They're so contemptible. There's a beautiful Ramban here. He reads all these three verses as one continuous idea. It starts off, verse 29, when Hashem, your God, will cut down these nations, you'll destroy them. After all, they're vulnerable because they did idolatry. And therefore, you may say, God does not like their idolatry. Why? Because they're worshiping foreign gods and not worshiping God. And you may think, huh, you know what I'll do? I'll take the practices that the Gentile Canaanite nations were doing to their gods, and I'll just do the same exact practices to our God. I'll do whatever things that they did, the practices of their idol worship, I'll do it for the Almighty. Don't do that because it is heinous and it is disgusting. And maybe we could take away from this is that you know the Torah is not only the guidebook uh, suggestions of how to connect to God, it is the authoritative way, and therefore we should be very wary of trying to invent our own ways of fulfilling the will of God. Not only do we have it, we have the authoritative way, Torah is the precise way for us to connect to God, and therefore we are advised to not deviate from it to create our own ways of worshiping God. Chapter 13 begins with another warning against adding or subtracting from the mitzvahs. And then we read in verse 2 the idea of a false prophet. This is someone who does an impressive miracle and tries to use that miracle as legitimacy to follow him to idolatry. And we're told not to listen to him. Well, how did he do the miracle if he's not legit? We don't know. We don't know exactly how they did it. But that is the test. God is testing us. He is giving us maybe the grounds that we should think. Maybe we should follow the person, the 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 false prophet who is advocating for idolatry. No, it's a test, and that person is executed. And this is the concept of a false prophet, someone who maybe presents the credentials of a legitimate prophet, but is not really a legitimate prophet, and they must be executed. Now, the commentaries here note that even someone who is a verified, a vetted prophet, they can tell us to do a sin 
under certain circumstances. Meaning, a prophet can never be someone who uproots Torah, a legitimate prophet. Why? Because the Torah was given to us perfect by Moses. Moses' prophecy, the Ram tells us, was substantiated by the highest and best methods of verification. Only Moses had the verification of Sinai, where the whole nation participated in his prophecy. That's a national revelation, a national verification of Moses' prophecy, and therefore Moses is the father of all prophets, and all other prophets are on a degree lower than Moses. And therefore, if a prophet wants to subsequently, after the passing of Moses, wants to uproot the Torah that was given to us by Moses— Well, unless they're on the level of Moses, they really cannot compete with him. And therefore, by definition, if a prophet tries to tell us to repudiate Torah, by definition, they are a false prophet. However, there is a situation when a verified prophet, such as Elijah, he could advise us the will of God is to temporarily suspend a mitzvah, provided that it's not idolatry, for a timely need. So, for example, Elijah, Mount Carmel, he brings sacrifices outside of the temple. We see that's prohibited. Yet, because he's a prophet, a verified, legitimate prophet, he could temporarily suspend one mitzvah, provide it's not idolatry, for a timely need. However, if a false prophet comes and tells us to do idolatry, even if it's only once, or that any one of the 613 mitzvahs is permanently annulled, then we know it's a false prophet and we can execute them as such. And then we read in verse 7 about the enticer for idolatry. If your brother, son of your mother, or the son of your daughter, or the wife of your bosom, or your friend who is like your own soul, will entice you secretly, saying, let us go and worship the gods of others, gods that you don't know, not you and not your forefathers. So you have someone who's trying to encourage others to do idolatry. Rashi tells us that it lists all these relatives and all these close people if we have to repudiate, repel, resist the enticer of idolatry who is a relative, someone someone that we're close to, certainly everyone else who we're not close to, we should not fall for their enticements. So what happens to such a person? They're trying to encourage us to follow the gods of the people around us, the Canaanites, those near, those far from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, you shall not accede to him. You should not hearken to him. Your eye shall not take pity on him. You should not be compassionate nor conceal from him. Rather, you should surely kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to kill him, and the hand of everyone else is afterwards. You should pelt him with stones. You should kill him. For he sought to make you stray from near Hashem, your God, to the land of Egypt, from the house of slavery, and everyone should participate in this. All of Israel should hear and fear, and they should not do the same thing in our midst. There's an amazing Rashi here. When it talks about the false gods that the enticer is trying to get us to follow, it says those that are near and those that are far. And Rashi tells us, quoting from the Talmud and Sanhedrin, that from the nature of the gods, the foreign gods that are close, we could learn about the nature of the foreign gods that are distant. Just as we are privy to the ones that are near. You have a figurine in your house or in your neighbor's house. You see it. You know it's ineffectual. You know it is useless. But you may think, you know what? In Nepal, somewhere in the Far East, then there's a god that's really powerful. No, from the ones that are close to you, you can find out what is the substance of the ones that is distant from you. And I think in general, with respect to heresy, there is this illusion that we could say, oh, you know what? There is some really bright atheist. He really understands it. It makes sense to him. There are smart people who get it. And the truth is we find out. Look at the atheist next door. You find out just how empty, how hollow the arguments are. And therefore, you could find out by extension that that that's really what they have. There is no meat in the bone. There is no Substance And someone who is an enticer, trying to entice people to idolatry, is treated differently. Whereas everyone else we're supposed to love, you should love your neighbor as yourself, this person we're not allowed to love. We're not allowed to listen to them. If they want to repent after the verdict has been decreed, they can't undo it. Whereas the rest of the Jews, we cannot stand idly when their blood is 
being shed, here we cannot show any pity. We cannot try to find any exculpation, any acquittal for this person. If we know a argument for their guilt, we cannot harbor it. We have to announce it. Such a person is executed and we have to remove such a blight from our people. And then verse 13, it talks about the Ir Hanidachas, which is a wayward and rebellious city. This is a city that the entire city, or at least the majority of the city, was convinced to follow the ways of idolatry. And they're treated not just as individuals, they're treated as an entire city. And even though someone who does idolatry is executed in a particular way, their money, for example, could be passed on to their heirs. Here in the city that the entire city did idolatry, the people are executed in a different method, and their money too is brought to the central square of the city, and it is burned. Now the Talmud tells us that this particular law never happened and never will happen, but there is a lesson inherent in it that we have to study. Maybe we could suggest that the lesson of the city, the wayward city, the city that everyone does idolatry, what's the lesson? The lesson is that bad company will invariably influence you. If you're in a city of rebellion, it's not just a collection of individuals. There is a certain ethos in the city that is about rejection of God. Don't think that you could inoculate yourself from that. Don't think that you could remain unscathed. No, you should know surely that it will influence you as well. Maybe that is the lesson. The Talmud tells us that when you want to buy a new home, more important than the layout or the amount of uh, rooms that you have, it's most important for you to inspect the neighbors. If you have good neighbors, neighbors who are God-fearing, neighbors that that are moral, neighbors that will help you become a better person, then you should buy the house. Otherwise, you should not. That's most important above all because that is going to determine how you change as a result of your new location. And in the city, that the city, the majority of the city is behaving in one way. It's not just by random chance that all these idolaters arrived in the city. It's because they were with each other and the social influence that they gave to each other caused them each to become worse. And the people that would have done okay would have been fine in a different city. They suffered as a result of their association and their proximity to the other idolaters. Chapter 14 begins with a very interesting mitzvah. You are children to Hashem your God. You shall not cut yourselves. You shall not make a bald spot between your eyes for a dead person. For you are a holy people to Hashem your God. Hashem has chosen you for himself to be a treasured people from among all the people on the face of the earth. Someone, God forbid, they lost a relative. They have a tendency to, in, in their agony, to cut themselves, to mourn. And we're told that it's prohibited for us to cut ourselves or to pull out our hair to make a bald spot over a dead person. We're holy. Hashem chose us. We're like children of Hashem, children of God, and therefore we should not behave in that fashion. Rashi tells us, quite simply, after all, we are children of God. It's appropriate for us to be to be beautiful and to not be all cut up and all bald. That's what Rashi says. Now, the Ramban asked an interesting question. The Ramban asked a question, after all, if it is because we're supposed to be a beautiful nation, why is it specifically limited to not make cuts and to not make bald spots over a dead person? And therefore, the Ramban suggests a different explanation of these verses, verse 1 and 2 of chapter 14. He says like this, very powerful idea. The verse is hinting at the promise that our souls will live forever even after our passing from this world. We're a holy nation. We're God's nation. We're God's treasured people. We're like his children. And therefore, there's none of us that are going to be lost after we die. And therefore, yes, when a relative, when someone close to us passes in this world, we have a tendency to feel like their departure is permanent. And we're so consumed with agony, you have to scratch yourself. You have to cut yourself. You have to mourn. You want to pull out your hair. But we have to remember, says the verse, we're children of God. And therefore, yes, while crying and mourning is natural, we have to still remember that the person is alive and maybe even more alive than they were 
prior, a very powerful idea that we see from the Ramban, to limit the amount of crying and mourning with the recognition, with the knowledge that the person who passed is really still alive. Now, the Talmud deduces from this verse a mitzvah to not have factionalism and infighting amongst the Jewish people. And perhaps the explanation is that, you know, when you have someone who takes his right hand and scratches his left arm and causes his left arm to bleed, that is what the mitzvah is describing, not to scratch yourself, not to cause a wound, not to make a cut over a dead person. Says the Talmud, our nation, we're like one person, we're like one entity, we're like one body. And therefore, when there's infighting, when there's factionalism, when there's discord and disunity, it's precisely akin to someone scratching themselves, taking the right hand and injuring the left hand. Chapter 14 continues with the laws of kosher animals. This is a repetition of what we learned in Leviticus. There are some more animals that are listed. We learn about kosher animals and kosher fish and kosher birds. It lists the non-kosher ones because there are more kosher ones and therefore it lists the fewer non-kosher ones. And then verse 22, we read about tithing. And there's all kinds of tithes like we talked about a little bit earlier, but it begins with you shall surely tithe the entire crop of your planting produce of your field year by year. This is the source, says the Talmud, that if someone gives charity, they're going to become wealthy. In fact, the Talmud tells us that there's only one area of our life that we're allowed to test God, and that is if we give charity, if we give 10% tithing, and it makes us rich. God promises you give 10% of your money to charity, I promise you will become wealthy, and test me on it. This is the one area where, where we are allowed to test God. And then it talks about the various kinds of tithing. It talks about, like we mentioned earlier, the second tithing, which is eaten in Jerusalem. If someone has, for example, so they're tremendously wealthy, they have so much produce, it's impossible to bring it to Jerusalem, they could convert it to money and bring the money to Jerusalem and to be used for the festivities in Jerusalem, to use the money to spend in Jerusalem. And then we read about the deadline for the miser, for the tithing of the three preceding years. As we know, every seven years, there's the Shemitah cycle. So there's no tithing because there's no produce. You don't own your produce. So we have six years and then one year, six years of, of working the field and one year of allowing the field to lay fallow. And the law states that the first and second and fourth and fifth years of this seven-year cycle you give the first tithing to the Levite, the second tithing you bring to Jerusalem, and the third and sixth, you give the first tithing to the Levite, and the second tithing is not eaten by you in Jerusalem, rather you give it to the poor people. And that is derived from this verse, verse 28, at the end of the three years, you should finish the tithing because all the various kinds of tithings were done, the first tithing to the Levite, the second tithing brought to Jerusalem, and the third tithing, which is like the tithing for poor people, you did that as well. Of course, there are other laws, like the laws of the Truma, which is a 2% that is given to the Kohen, and the Levite himself has to give something to the Kohen. Of course, these laws are complicated, uh, but here is where some of these laws are conveyed. And then we read chapter 15 about the laws of Shemitah with respect to money. And that is that all outstanding personal loans are nullified at the conclusion of the Shemitah year. So every seven years, all your personal loans are nullified. My dear friend Dan Coleman had a theory that the human body, it recycles all of its cells every seven years. And therefore, each Shemitah year, you're an entirely different body just on a, on a granular level. All your cells have been updated and are completely new ones from the ones that were there seven years. And therefore, the person that borrowed from you, they didn't borrow from this iteration of you. They borrowed from a different iteration of you. And therefore, to remember the idea that our bodies are temporary and our soul is permanent, we're told to nullify all the outstanding personal loans. And then we read that if we obey the will of God, we won't need to loan each other. Everyone will be wealthy, but in the event that there is someone who is not wealthy, there is a mitzvah to give charity to the paupers, to give them what they need and everything that they need. Meaning, we don't have to give them excess, we don't have to make them wealthy, 
But we have to give them everything that they need. And if there's someone, let's say, who has fallen from their grace, they were wealthy in the past, they lost their wealth, then their needs are greater than the person who was always poor and therefore included in charity is, says the Talmud, quoted by Rashi over here in verse 7 and 8, is that we're required to give them a horse to ride on and maybe if even a slave to run in front of them to announce their arrival. We're also told that it's missed to help find a pauper, a wife, and if someone refuses a handout, it's a mitzvah to give them a loan as well. Now, this is a very challenging mitzvah. The idea that I'm going to give someone a loan, and not only can I can I not charge them interest, but the Shemitah cycle comes around, and now the loan is completely nullified. It's void. I cannot even go get the money back, even the principal. And therefore, you may think or you may have a temptation to not loan people towards the end of the seventh year. Be aware, verse 9, lest there be a lawless thought in your heart saying the seventh year approaches, the remission year, and you will look malevolently upon your destitute brother and refuse to give him. Then he may appeal against you to Hashem and it will be a sin upon you. You should surely give him. Let your heart not feel bad when you give him for in return for this matter. Hashem, your God, will bless you in all your deeds and in every undertaking. For destitute people will not cease to exist within the land. And therefore, I command you saying, open up your heart, open up your hand to your brother, to the poor, to the destitute in your land. This is a very difficult, challenging mitzvah. And that is to loan someone even towards the end of the Shemitah year. Now, the Talmud tells us, that people, unfortunately, were not fulfilling this mitzvah. And therefore, when Hillel arrived to the scene in the end of the uh, first century before the Common Era, he created a loophole in which someone could transfer their loans to the court. And even though personal loans are nullified at the end of the Shemitah year, loans given to an entity like the court are not nullified. And therefore, via this loophole, Hillel facilitated that people will fulfill the mitzvah and always be loaning their money to their brothers in need. And the Talmud, in fact, tells us that this is the concept of tikkun olam, of fixing the world. Hillel was so concerned that the Torah will be ignored and that people will not loan their brothers. And therefore, he instituted and standardized this process of conveying the loans to the court and ensuring that people will not cease loaning at this time. Now, there is an obvious contradiction that all the commentaries ask. In verse 4, it talks about that if we obey the will of God, we won't need to loan each other. Everyone will be wealthy. And then in verse 11, it says that there's always going to be poor people. How is that possible? So the Ramban here, he says that some opinions try to reconcile these two verses by saying that the people will never fulfill the conditions of verse 4, and therefore there will never be a situation in which everyone will be wealthy. However, the Ramban disagrees and he says, no, the Torah makes a lot of predictions and the Torah makes a lot of hints to the future, but there is never a prophecy in the Torah that talks about us explicitly disobeying the laws of the Torah and to create a new mitzvah as a result of, of us disobeying a preceding mitzvah. And therefore, the way he understands it is that the norm is that the Jewish people should be rich because the norm is we obey the Torah. And therefore, when it talks about in verse 11 that there's never going to be a situation that there's no paupers, what it means is, is that you can never guarantee that every single generation over every single one of the centuries will always completely be obedient of all the laws and therefore it's important to have in this unusual situation where people are disobeying the Torah and therefore are not receiving the bountiful blessing, it's important for you to not withhold from loaning your fellow in their time of need. Verse 12, we read about the laws of a Jewish servant. You have a Jewish servant either because they stole and no money to pay and the court sold them or they voluntarily decided to sell themselves. They're there for a maximum of six years. These laws, of course, we saw in the book of Exodus. And here we see an additional law that is when they go free, you have to give them a parting gift. You have to give them various animals, various other gifts 
as a way to send them off gracefully and with joy. We read about the tithing of firstborn animals given to the Kohen. What happens if that animal has a blemish? The blemish demotes it and it can be eaten by anyone anywhere. Chapter 16, it's starting to talk about the three festivals and the mitzvah that we have to go to the temple, to go to Jerusalem during those festivals. And there's an additional insight that we glean from this, and that is to make leap years to synchronize the lunar month cycle that we have with the solar seasonal cycle that is the yearly cycle, meaning that the Jewish people, we follow a lunar month and a solar year. If we didn't synchronize those two, every year would be 11 days earlier in the cycle, in the season cycle, in the solar year cycle, the 365 and a quarter day year year cycle. And because we're told to make Pesach, to make Passover in the springtime, that is a mitzvah for us to synchronize these two calendar system, the monthly system and the yearly system. And the Rabban points out that this is the third time that we're informed about the festivals and here there are many of the laws of the festivals that are omitted. For example, the prohibition of doing work on the first day of Pesach. We don't talk about taking the lulav and its associated species on Sukkot. And it's because it's not ignoring the previous times that it talked about the festivals, rather it's giving us some new laws, for example, the mitzvah of ascending to Jerusalem for the pilgrimage, the various festival celebratory sacrifices, the clearing out of the tithal responsibilities, and therefore it repeats them. So it begins with Pesach and the laws of the Pesach sacrifice and the time frames for the Pesach, the pastoral sacrifices. We talk about the counting of the Omer, which is from Pesach to Shavuot, 50 days later. There's a very interesting citation here by Rabbeinu Bachai. He tells us that there's four mitzvos that must be done standing, and they are the counting of the Omer, the donning, the wearing of the tzitzis, the bris mila, and the mitzvah of lulav. Very intriguing list based upon a midrash. We read about the Shavuos festival, and we read about the importance to be happy, to be joyous in verse 11. The verse states, you you shall rejoice before Hashem, your God, you, your son, your daughter, and your slave, and your maidservant, the Levite who is in your cities, the proselyte, the orphan, and the widow who are among you. Beautiful Rashi here. Rashi says that it is a mitzvah for us to be happy, to be joyous, to be glad during the festivals, but it's important for us to gladden Four people that are God's people, i.e. the Levite, the proselyte, the convert, the orphan, and the widow, those are the people that are, so so to speak, God's worrying over. If we make them happy, then he will make our four people happily, namely our son, our daughter, our maidservant, and our male servant. We take care of God. God will take care of our people. And then we read about the festival of Sukkot and the mitzvah to be joyous on the festival. And the Talmud tells us that joy, the happiness that we're supposed to do on the festivals is manifested in meat and wine for men and jewelry for women. I guess things have not changed that much. And an interesting question at the end of the Parsha here is that if you read the descriptions of the celebrations of the festivals, you'll notice that three times it talks about joy on Sukkot and only once on Shavuot and no times on Pesach. And we know that the mitzvah to be joyous in the festivals, it is the same on all three of these festivals. And there's many answers to this question as to why it mentions joy three times on Sukkot, once on Shavuot and no times on Pesach. But the Rabbeinu B'chai here quotes a midrash, very interesting idea. He says that the Talmud tells us that there's four times in the year that the world is judged. Once on Pesach, once on Shavuot, once on Rosh Hashanah, and once on Sukkot. And he says that when someone is amidst judgment or has pending judgment, they really have a very difficult time being joyous. And therefore, Pesach, the beginning of the year, 
you haven't had any judgment yet. Therefore, it doesn't mention joy at all by Pesach. Whereas on Shavuot, you already did the judgment of Pesach, and therefore you could be happy once. And on Sukkot, you've already done three previous judgments, once on Pesach, once on Shavuot, and once on Rosh Hashanah, it therefore mentions joy three times. Very interesting idea. And the Parsha concludes that there's a mitzvah for us to ascend to the temple, to the tabernacle, to Jerusalem on these three festivals, to not come empty-handed, to bring with us the pilgrimage, elevation sacrifices, and the various other celebratory peace offerings. And this should be all proportional to the wealth that Hashem, our God, has given to us. The next couple of weeks are also going to be a lot of mitzvahs, one after another. And I look forward to speaking to you then. Rabbi Yaakov Wolby, RabbiWolby at gmail.com. We'll speak next week.